Hello and welcome to the Heresy Lodge. I am your host, Dylan Cooper of the Consa Coast over there. Gavin Franklin. And I think I timed it okay. I don't know. This new Skype was It looked right on my end. It looked right. We'll figure it out. Uh, anyway, as always, guys, this week we are doing a preview of The Eventual Spirit from the one and only Graham McNeil. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Graham was definitely intended to write this book. It's 600 and some pages long. Although, now that I'm at the halfway point, there's already, like, a story I'm like, they probably could have just fucking cut this and I wouldn't have even noticed. So maybe. I don't know. It's very Graham where it's long as hell. Yes. But that story will probably come into play, like, last 15 pages of the book like uh I it'll see. come in like five books later we're like what yeah. <laughs> anyway um last week was our shoot the shit episode if you didn't listen to that give it a listen it was a good time it's a good time it, for sure um if you want to contact us get on our discord it's a lot of fun more people keep joining in we're having more meetups some people just kind of hang out in the chat and talk anyway it's it's really cool to see you can do that by going to our Twitter. It is pinned to the top at Heresy Lodge. You can email us, and I can give you the link there at theheresylodge at gmail.com. Also, if you just have comments, criticisms, whatever, send them our way. If you're on YouTube, please like, subscribe, comment, do all the things there. We do have tips enabled on Twitter. If you feel like contributing to the podcast, everything goes back into it. And that's it. That's all of our things. Good deal. Gavin, before we get too far into things, uh, how was your vacation? Good time? It was a good time. It's pretty, it was exhausting. Um, it was not one of those relaxed vacations. I got to see a lot of um, national parks. So, so it was fun. Zion, Grand Canyon, Death Valley. Would highly recommend. Cool. And uh, didn't lose money in Vegas, so I can't complain. Hey, that's... Honestly, that's impressive on its own. Yeah. Such an impressive guy. <laughs> Look at Wait. me. <laughs> I gained $100. <laughs> <laughs> What are you drinking? I am drinking cotton candy wine from I've, in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, I had that. It's in all... Gatlinburg. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not a fan of it. It's I don't like cotton super candy. Super sweet. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, I had it's not my favorite. Honeymoon. It's not my favorite. Yeah, it's, I did uh, not enjoy it either. Overwhelmingly sweet, I would say. Yeah, it's like one of those places that like there was like someone outside that was like, we have cotton candy wine. And we're like, whatever, we'll try it. I was like, ah, it. what the hell is this shit? Yeah, if you guys haven't been to Gatlinburg and you enjoy enjoy drinking, I would definitely suggest it because you can you can get pretty drunk for free in Gatlinburg. Yeah, especially <laughs> on wine. Like if you like wine, Moonshine. that's the place to go. Yeah, Moon, I don't know what it is about that place, but it's like uh, $5 so you can taste everything we've ever created in our entire lives. And I'm like, well, here you go. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I went to a moonshine tasting place in Nashville uh, a few weeks ago, and it was like, give us five, $5 and you get to taste everything we created. It was exactly what it was. It ended up being like five shots. I was like, this is very dangerous. Where am I right now? Yeah, it was um, it was a lot. But yeah, what are, what are you drinking, sir? I am drinking as the weather is getting nicer. A good old Samuel Adams summer ale. It's too soon. Well, you see, yesterday it was seventy degrees and it was really nice. That's Today it's like fifty-five. But hey, you win some, you lose some. This is still very good. I'm a big fan <laughs> of Sam Adams anyway. Sam Adams is pretty great. I don't know why it's not a more popular uh, beer. Yeah. yeah, their summer beer is good. The fucking what's the IPA that we actually really like? Seventy six. Oh, what they do? 76. I don't think it's an IPA, though. Is it not? Or I really like Cold Snap as well. Cold Snap's good. Their Oktoberfest is very good. It's like my Safe. standard. Yeah. yeah. Yep. They have good stuff. You should all everyone should drink them. If you don't like them, you're fucking wrong. Okay. <laughs> Came out swinging. So before we get into Vengeful Spirit, uh, there has been a uh, we're, a community update to the tabletop. We figured we'd take some time to talk about it. We've gotten a lot of good feedback about whenever we talk about some changes and updates to the tabletop and what our thoughts are on it. 
I wouldn't say either of us are particularly um, major experts. I've I've won some RTTs. We are I've, good at the game. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like I, I've won some RTTs, got pretty high placings in some GTs, but like never won one. So I would, I would, we're no like art of war or anything. But no, I spent like five minutes reading. I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I, I, I've deep dived into it a little yeah, bit. I was like, but... how does this affect me? And then I'm like, hmm, this is kind of nice, actually. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what it did and and how I how we think it's going to affect games. Um, and I think it's, I, overall, I think it's a phenomenal change. There's a couple of things that I'm worried about that are on like the outliers of things. Um, so they, they nerfed the Tau like <laughs> crazy, took away indirect fire. Um, they didn't take it away. They just made it useless. So, um, yeah, it's pretty hard to hit. It's. You know what, minus one, if you if you can't see it's minus one to hit and they get plus one to their save against it which is a huge nerf to all indirect fire um which is something that i think is a good thing but one thing that i think is hilarious is like orcs just keep getting like fucked by <laughs> these changes that aren't even like that big of a deal to them. So they have their squid buggies that are all indirect fire shooting and they're like, okay, now they suck. <laughs> <laughs> and they made it illegal for orcs to take like everything that made orcs good. It's like when the orc codex came out, they were like, oh, these are really good lists. And GW exclusively like all of these lists are illegal. You can't take <laughs> multiple buggies. You can't take multiple planes. It's all illegal. Yeah. Fuck you guys. And, but they let Admech and Drakari like do what they did for, for a an year entire and a half. Year. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, Tau, they lost that. Uh, their, the bodyguard rule has changed drastically. So, that's a big hit on a lot of um, a lot of things, I would say, including custodes with the bodyguards for Trajan Valoris. Uh, obviously, Tau are hit pretty huge on that. So, basically, all it does is it gives them lookout, sir, rule. So, you can no longer have your, your person that you're bodyguarding in front because then they're still eligible to be shot at if they're the closest model. So um, kind of an interesting change there. So that all of that is really big hit to Tau. And then they took away the AP from Manka. And then it was like, <laughs> oh, OK. So that's Which is kind of the whole hit. thing for Manka. Exactly. So now Manka is kind of like, I can advance and shoot without penalty for the first three turns. OK, but why would you want to now? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think... When it comes down to it, they have moved Tau down to almost like a C tier level army. It went from S tier to C tier pretty quickly. <laughs> um, there's still things they can do. I think we're going to see, uh, since broadsides lost score and don't have indirect fire, I think we're going to see less of them. They're still good based off of points, but I think we're going to see the transition to hammerheads. I think we're going to see a lot more of those. Maybe three per army would be the competitive move for Tau now. But we'll see. Um, the other big thing that's huge, but they the, did the, the a few things. They, they for Harlequins, they just basically took away a lot of the broken comps. Their sniper is no longer super viable. The fact that uh, they had an ability that made it to where everything was six inches further away in a bubble, and now it's a select unit is six inches further away. That's a decent nerf. Um, and they made all of their flying ships, which is what they took. They were taking like thirteen ships, yeah, basically. Crazy. They're now like extra 40 points. So like they're they're at like 130 from 90. Yeah. And the other one's like an extra 15 points, the smaller ones. And I'm like, that that's a huge hit. So I still think they're gonna be okay. Um, but I think they're gonna be better than the Tau still, but I think they're gonna struggle a little bit with the rest of the competition. Are they still just it's also still a new codex and there's a lot of a lot of things that people haven't done yet. Yeah. Like I've been look because I got my Eldar codex not too long ago, and like I've been just like playing with lists and stuff in my head. That's a lot of really cool shit that I haven't seen people do yet. And I'm like, hmm. Yeah. I think Eldar are in an interesting place because I think they're going to come out and be... I don't think they're going to be as broken as Harlequins, but I think they're going to be they're definitely a, a thing that you see more often. They have the Custodes, which is the last army that I would say is like top tier. They got a few nerfs, a few limitations on their... Um, stratagems like you can only use them once per game 
Uh, they can't transhuman their bikes anymore, um, which is nice. And only infantry or only troop keywords instead of infantry are obsec. So it took away a lot of obsec from them as well. So kind of like the least nerfed nerfed faction in the <laughs> codex. I would say they kind of broke away like scot free a little bit uh, compared to the Tau and the Harlequin. So I think they're still going to be a very competitive list. Now, yeah. next big thing that I think is changing the meta greatly is the what the the change to uh Astartes and here yeah Astartes. it's fucking nuts so they get minus one on ap which is fucking crazy yeah so they basically well, if something hits them the ap is is worse by one so if it's an ap minus one weapon it's ap zero ap minus two mm -hmm. ap one that kind of thing so that's that's insane you compare you like that's insane on regular Astartes but who really got out scot-free in this edition and in this bound state of sleep, Death Guard and Thousand Sons really won out from this. I think I think the Grey Knights are going to be a top tier team too. I think as well. I think now with that addition and some things that have changed, I think the major armies you're going to see up top are Eldar. I think they're going to have a really rough time hanging in with the Marines. But I think you'll see them and Necrons um and harlequins kind of just like in there hanging out and then you have your custodes um and then the top tier things that i think you're really going to see i think custodes will be up there but i think you'll see dark angels with their terminators their death shroud terminators they're going to be discussing now with that ap ignoring um death guard terminators also got obsec that's going to be crazy yeah I think uh, Thousand Suns and Grey Knights are going to be up there as well. I think you're going to see those like five five major armies kind of battling it out for top seed. But the good thing is, what I like about this, they're it's not variety. insanely overpowered. It's variety and they're not crazy. Well, don't worry. Tyranids are coming out. That's the problem. That's <laughs> the elephant in the room. And so the one elephant I think is the orcs who just got fucked. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they kind of nerf the top things. Like like you have the scale. You have all the crazy shit up here, like the custodes, the town, the harlequins, and then you have your mediocre space marines. And you have your orcs, and they're like, okay, let's squeeze these two together. And then the orcs are still down here with like chaos, who got nothing. Chaos is terrible still. Imperial oh, they guard. They get a new codex in like a month. We'll see. Yeah, hopefully. Imperial Guard got a little bit of a side grade. Nothing crazy. I'm pretty crazy. sure the Guard actually got a decent one with their... Because their indirect fire didn't get hit. Yeah, they're, 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 they're the only ones that can explode now or something. Yeah, they're Lasgun sixes. They're regimental sixes. Um, which is like, it's okay. So it's, it's okay. It's not like... It's not going to bring them up to the level of space. Yeah, points. it's not going to be an S. Yeah. And so... I think sisters are going to be at that level too, because sisters got more miracle dice. They did lose their bodyguard stuff though, so that's going to be debatable. Necrons are going to be like I, the, what I like about this right now is like all of these armies can kind of do something. Yeah, which is cool. I think it's funny the salamanders. Everyone's like, oh, a salamanders got a nerf. I think they kind of got shit on a bit because <laughs> the salamanders' like special trait was they got to ignore AP one, and they're like, well, f let's just give it to everybody. And Didn't then, they give them something else, though? Yeah, you can't re-roll wound rolls against salamanders. I'm like... Oh, that's kind of cool. Okay. <laughs> I don't like, know how many things that should give, like, wound rerolls, but that's still pretty good. Yeah, but the thing is, like, salamanders already had the ignoring AP1, and so they kind of, like, got buffed, like, this much, <laughs> and all the other space marines got buffed, like, this much, in my opinion, because they got to keep all of yeah. their original chapter tactics. I think White Scars are going to be sick of shit, ignoring AP1 and advancing and charging. That's going to be awesome. Um, but Tyranids, let's talk about some Tyranids and the problem that I think Games Workshop is going to face is there is nothing that has come out in the Tyranid Codex um, that has excluded Crusher Stampede which is the special regimental army they have. And uh, that's going to be nasty. That's gonna, If Crusher Stampede is still allowed in the game, they're going to be like SS tier while everything else is A. 
Um, like, I don't think we have anything in the S tier anymore, which is great. Yeah. So the Tyranids, I think, will have a higher win rate than the Harlequins did before the data balance. If that was, pressure that was high. Is allowed. Yeah. So if the FAQ and take the Crusher Stampede out, I think Tyranids are going to be an S-tier army and not like an SS. So I think Tyranids are just going to have a really easy time here, and that's why I think Games Workshop is getting their like, back against the walls because they keep releasing these data slates that are balancing the game at that exact moment, and then the next week, a Codex releases, and it, it fucks everything up because now that's the most powerful thing. They really need to stop doing this flavor of the month. If they can release the Imperial Knights and Chaos Knights at the same level as Space Marines right now, with this balanced data slate, I think it would be like one of the best renditions of the game we've ever had. Well, I don't understand. As sure, if it takes them, you know, so long to do like X amount, why not do like a quarterly release for like three or four codexes at once? Yeah, I mean, give you time to actually fucking read your shit, so you don't have to FAQ it a week later. The real issue. I mean, there's so many issues with the way Games Workshop <laughs> runs their rules. I mean, the question is, like, why the hell are their rules not free? That's a big problem. Amen. <laughs> that makes competition so hard. Like, I would be willing to pay a subscription service to f- see all of your rules. But right now, you still have to pay a subscription service and buy the rules to get a digital copy. And I'm like, what is this shit? So it's it's very annoying the way that they run their rules. And they previously, in other editions, did mass releases, like you say. But somebody at Games Workshop found out they can make more money off of media hype for releases. <laughs> so they decided so to fucking do it. annoying. Yeah, it's pretty terrible. But I think this is the balanced data slate was really good. I think they nerfed Tau a little too hard, personally. I'm a Tau player, I know. But <laughs> I, I think you're just going to see, I don't know. With the, I think the Monka change really screwed over a lot of the builds that Tau have. Because if you think about it, the real problem is now you have people that are ignoring an AP and your Monka takes away an AP. That's a two AP swing in the meta, right? That's huge. Wasn't it, isn't like three, two, one or two, one, zero, something like that for your AP? So the AP was the always range. an additional AP, but the range changed. It was 18 inches, 12 inches. Oh, okay. Nine inches, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So having that AP taken away. And then you have things like Thousand Suns, Grey Knights, Death Guard getting higher in the meta, which are ignoring an AP innately. All of a sudden, your plasma rifles, which were coming in at AP4, are now coming in at AP2. And you're like, ah. <laughs> and didn't Thousand Suns, did they already ignore one and two? No, but they they get plus one to their save on damage one weapons, and they can reduce the damage characteristic of a weapon by one. So you can throw them in cover, okay, hit them with an AP4 weapon, uh, damage to AP4 weapon, something like that, right? Okay, well, because of this new rule, it's now AP3, and then you reduce the damage by one, which gives them plus one to their save, and they're in cover, so it's plus two to their save. So they're at, like... Negative one save, AP three, so there's still two ups. Stupid. At, at AP four damage to weapon. Yeah, it's it's really gross. It's really really gross, and that only does one damage. So there's just a lot of durability behind the terminators. I think the terminators went out so big in this codex or this yeah. this balance update, like death squad, death Shroud terminators, um, the. Dark Angel Terminators, Scarab Cult Terminators, they're just going to be nasty. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing about the, the balance stuff. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's go into it. Ventral let's Spirit. Get into the book. Um, so, if you haven't listened to our Garo episode, I'm going to spoiler something right here. If you look at the character list, one is obviously going to stick out, and it is Gavril Logan. And I'm really glad we did Garo. Because in like the first fucking chapter, it's like, and here it comes Gabriel Logan. And I was like, okay. And then he's basically the main character. Kind of. I haven't fucking, I've seen him like three times. Yeah. So this book is massive and there is a huge list of characters, a lot of side stories going on, but it is really cool. I do have problems 
so far. I mean, yes. I don't want to complain too much about it because it is a really good book. And we've kind of been doing a lot of complaining about books recently. But <laughs> um, you see so many characters returned <laughs> in yes. this book. As So think of the cast of the first book and you will you will see almost every single one of them or hear about every single one of them in some way. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my kind of my uh, thought process on it. But this cast list is so big, I think we can spend a lot of time kind of going through and talking about these characters and where they were previously before the story started. Yeah. Uh, one also thing, just before we get too far into it, my biggest complaint about this book is they keep trying to put Horace in danger and we know he's not going to die and it annoys the fuck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I should have died. Like, cool. Obviously, you're fucking not going to continue. Yeah, we we kind of know the story, and we're on book twenty nine of fifty four before we even get to the siege. So I'm gonna assume he lives, considering the entire thing is called the Horus Heresy. Yeah, <laughs> but yes. Uh, so just going straight down, we have Horus Looper Cool. Have we yeah. seen him since Looper Cow? Did you say Looper Cool? I did say Looper Cool. Do you read it as Looper Cool? No, I actually do say Looper Cow. I don't know why my, <laughs> my mouth said that. <laughs> yeah, we last saw him in Nemesis when he was almost assassinated. Or technically, we saw him cut off Erebus's face. No, he had to do that. Yeah. Good for him. Um, that was good. They bring this that up like multiple times in this book. Yeah. I wish uh, they would just would have fucking killed Erebus. Yeah, it would have been a lot better, I think. Uh, so Horus is War Master. One thing that's interesting to me about the Horus in this book and the last time we saw Horus is he seems like less of a corrupted asshole. Like he seems yeah. more like the Horus from the first book. Um, and if you compare him to the Hor Horus in the third book where he's been corrupted by chaos, that Horus is like death, destruction. I must kill all innocent people. And he doesn't even, he's not even thinking that way now. No. Yeah. It is kind of like the Horus we actually kind of like. Which I like, but I don't like, because I'm like, can you just give me a, a character? Yeah, maybe it's one of those things where, like, this book is supposed to make you, like, think, oh, maybe Horus is right. I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, we'll uh, see what happens. Mortarion, we last saw him in Scars. He failed in recruiting the Khan. Got beat up a little bit by the Khan. He did. This dude gets beat up a lot. Nice. But he's resilient. This there's also some things in this book that happened to Mortarion that I really want to talk about because the more I read about Mortarion, the more I can't stand how his character is written because he doesn't make any sense. Yes. Also, I would expect the Death Shroud to not be easily replaceable. Yes. So the Death Shroud just keep popping back up. So it's like, oh, I have, was it seven? Yeah, it's seven. I have seven Death Shroud. Four of them died. I got four more. All seven died and replaced them. It's like they just keep like... He, he can pick up anyone as the Death yeah Shroud. they're supposed to be badasses right why are they so easily replaceable kind of like the fucking phoenix guard like they're yeah. supposed to be like your top fucking people and lucius kills them all by himself like this makes no fucking sense to me yeah i think that the a lot of the terminators or at least like the the honor guard of the primarchs they're not doing very good. I'm trying to think of like an honor guard that was like decent. The fucking Raven guard, dude, Braun. <laughs> yeah. And he got know. fucking left behind at one point. Yeah. It's not very great. No. Ferris man just got his head chopped off. They didn't do their job very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they fucking suck there. Like the pirate guard were kind of cool. Um, yeah. They got a nuke chopped on them. And then some of them still live. That's a very salamander thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I agree. You see the the death shroud in here a lot, and you're like, what is happening with them? Yep. We have Fulgrim. So the last we saw Fulgrim was Angel Exterminatus. He is in full demon weird ass form right now. A fucking like a lizard thing, I think. Snake. Snake yeah. Whatever. I can't. Uh, like, why is everyone like so normal about it? I'd be like. What the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very strange to see because you get a scene with a uh, few Primarchs standing together and Fulcrum is in his full weird ass form <laughs> and no one like acknowledges it. 
<laughs> like it writes about again. it and it's like he looks really weird it's so strange but no one says that no one's like hey what's going on what did he turn into a fucking snake yeah <laughs> like, why especially like maybe like if horse like didn't say anything sure but the other primark there should have been like what the fuck are you <laughs> <laughs> the next one we have is Lehman russ um I like Lehman what I've Russ, seen Lehman so far. Lehman Russ starts this book in a place that I'm very confused at. Um, basically, the last time we saw Lehman Russ in the story that we read through is he was running from the Alpha Legion or hiding from the Alpha Legion. It was being attacked by the Alpha Legion. Yeah, and we get told in this story that he gets saved by the First Legion. Yeah, the lion just shows up, fucks off with the... The Alpha Legion is like, all right, I guess I'm going to fucking Makarage. Yeah, so we get told <laughs> in this in this book that the lion shows up, defeats the Alpha Legion, tells him and Russ that he's on his way to Makarage, and then disappears. And the lion's like, all right, I'm going to Terra. I don't remember reading Lehman. that. Yeah, it's just, just kind of happened. Like, oh, you know, maybe it's a short story that we haven't got to yet. Maybe. Also, speaking of short story, we see Nagasena in here. There is a short story of him hunting down. Yeah. What's his face? We talked about this in one of the podcasts. It's a it is a um, Severin is his name. But yeah, Severin. Audio drama. Yeah, that has not made stupid. its way into written short story. So the, that's a note. This book is like one of those things. It's like you really need to read so many short stories and we probably missed some. But the whole lion thing, like, and there's just so much that it has to prepare you to read this book to get an understanding of it. Um, yeah, we one, have the lion thing, the Loken thing. Uh, I mean, I guess Severin. Yeah, Severin and that whole situation. Um, a couple of the Garo stories on, like, the making of Titan. I don't even know how who some of these night errants even are. Like, where the mm. fuck did this iron warrior come from? He's hilarious. He is very funny. Uh, we also have Rogel Dorn. I haven't seen a lot of Rogel Dorn at home in one scene. Rogel he Dorn. A couple times. He's building a wall. Oh, another short story. This we have I act and Cruz and Dorn on that prison. Yeah, the last remembrance or short story. Yep. Yeah, that happens. Like all of these short stories happen like right before or actually during the vengeful spirit. Yeah. So there's just so much that you should really prepare for before you even dive into this book. All right, then we get into the Sons of Horus. We have Abaddon. Abaddon is still Abaddon. He seems more <laughs> angry now than he ever has before. Yeah. He's supposed to be the most badass of badasses. I haven't quite seen that yet. Um, so this is kind of important, uh, a little a little confusing. Um, Falkus Kai, Kaibre, the Widowmaker, he is a Morning of Old member now. There is a short story. I will say also <laughs> from a short story. <laughs> there is a short story. Um, I don't remember what it's called, but it's about Axeman recruiting. I think it's called Little Horse. Yeah. Axeman recruits people to join the Morning Bowl. So you kind of need to read that short story to understand who these people are uh so you have uh falcus uh Kyber. he's what he's the widow maker he's like abaddon's choice he's very strong headed um kind of fighter um so he a lot of times in this book whenever they ask him about tactics he's the person that's like go straight forward do this blow this up yada yada then you have um callus ekadon And then you have <laughs> Horace Axemon. So Ho little Horace, obviously, we last saw him in a short story. He got they talk about it a lot. He got his like face cut off and then glued back on. Which happened in that same short story. Yep. He uh also the honestly the beginning is is the following the following of a short story of when Axemon got his face cut off like that whole planet 
is like the beginning of this arc. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I like his character more than I think anyone else in the Luna Wolves or Sons yeah. of Horus, except for yeah. maybe um, Nactua. But we'll get to him. Next up, we have Sir Gar Targost, the Lodge Master. He yes. got all fucked up, apparently. I don't know if that's yeah. something that was in a short story. <laughs> we haven't got to it yet, probably. <laughs> I don't remember him. It's just a name that occurred in the first three books. He was the reason, Lodge Master. I thought he was the one that got shot in the head. No, it was I a different keep guy. Up. Different, different one. Um, so he. He does some stuff in a ritual that we'll talk about in this in this in the review because some things happen in that ritual that I'm like, what is going on? Um, Lev Goshen. Yep. Grail, <laughs> <laughs> Grail Noctua, the Warlock. So this is another one of the guys that is in the Morning Bowl. He is supposed to be the calm-minded, level-headed replacement for Loken, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he does a very good job. I really like his character, the way he thinks tactically, some things that he does. And the most interesting thing is he's not a captain. He's a fucking sergeant. Yeah, just a sergeant, which wasn't that also how Loken was? Uh, I think Loken was a captain. Okay. Oh, yeah. He was just not of like the next company or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have Malagurst, the Twisted. So obviously, we all know Malagurst. He's a really weird guy, walks around um, limping like a weirdo. Yeah. At one point, they're even like, I don't even know if he's even that hurt. <laughs> he's just faking it now. Um, he does the exact same thing he's always done. He just advises the War Master. He um, is plays a bigger role in the lodges now. He's becoming closer to the dark arts. It's getting real weirdly word bear style. He's tattooed like word bear shit on him, and I'm like, ah. It's not like something Malhurst would do. Yeah. Then we have Gurgurdon. <laughs> <laughs> he has the ritual done on him. Yeah, so if you look at the character description, he is a looper Kai, which is it's literally the exact same thing as a Valborak, uh, but they do it a little bit differently um, in the Sons of Horus. But it's still weird word bear shit. Yep. They do weird some weird word bear, bear shit. shit. Okay, then we get some Death Guard. Kaifa Morag. Doesn't ring any bells to me yet. Doesn't ring a bell to me either. He does come up. I just can't remember. But then we have one. Ignatius Grolgor. If this name doesn't sound familiar to you, it probably shouldn't because he's a character in the fourth book that is a thing sometimes and then dies. But he's back. Yes. He is back. Indeed, he was the one who was... Zagaro. Yeah. And then died. Then it was this the one that his house Carl killed. He like sealed the doors and let the life eater virus kill everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why this guy comes back as the eater of lives. Whoa. Such a fucking death guard bullshit thing. I am Ignatius Grilgor, the eater of lives. And I am so hungry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the whole scene with him and being introduced into the book is very strange. Yeah, like one of my least favorite scenes so far because I'm like, no, the, the whole thing is just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes, it's like, why did this have to happen? Uh, Gergeradon is also dead before the the book begins. So this this is all about just bringing people back for a little bit of a one time. It's like it's like when the Marvel stocks are going down, they're like quick release an Avengers movie where they bring everybody back from the cast. What if they bring back characters? I, I don't give a fuck about half of these guys. I don't give a shit about Ignatius. I don't even remember War. that name. <laughs> um, I actually thought when it was when it was talking about it that the person that was going to come back was going to be Decius. Decius. They happened to cool. That would have been a little bit more interesting. All right. So now we have Ultramarines. Castor Alcade. So there is a planet called Moloch that is the prime, it's the centerpiece of this story. 
he is in charge of the planet's defenses. Not in charge of the planet. We'll get to that. He's in charge of like the the ultramarine garrison there. Um, I don't know anything about the other ones. Yeah, I have no idea who these people are. And I mean, kind of, kind of the same thing with like the blood angels. There's a blood angels, just some blood angels there too. Got some ultramarine, some, some blood, blood angels, angels chilling on the planet. Why are the blood angels there? Yeah, why is there two know. different squads of, old, of fucking Astartes there? That is weird. Something about there is always some centurion of the Blood Angels or some squad of the Blood Angels on Moloch for some ritual that they do or whatnot. It's like a honor guard thing. Um, they're led by Vitus Salakar. Salakar. And he's a... He's a bit of a gymnast. Yeah, he's he does, <laughs> does gymnast things. The Emperor's children would love him. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that little fairy. Next we have Legio Crucius. Um, so this one, Itana Kalonice. So Legio Crucius is the largest. They have the largest titan on Moloch. And Itana Colonice is the precept of Paragon of Terra, which is supposed to be the largest titan on Moloch. Um, and then you have people that are in that Legio. Um, and then you have two other Legios that are a thing, uh, Fortidus, Fortidus and Gryphonicus. So I'm sure whenever during this book, we haven't quite got there yet, but whenever the battle just goes crazy, there'll be an entire chapter of just Titans blowing each other up. It's about halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> Which says a lot, because that halfway through and you get it through like half the characters. Okay. You have the Mechanicum. I have no idea who this Mechanicum person is. He's the, I'm assuming it's the Mechanicum person stationed on Moloch. Uh, maybe there's like a pair of twins that are also there that both have like their own little titan type of deal. I don't know. It's hard to keep up, honestly. House Divine's at least got a story going. House Divine. So we move away from the Legios. And this is something that I think we should talk about on a special episode at one point and do some research on. I'm very confused by the... um power politics yeah. and the power behind the legios in the houses so a legio is an order of titans and a house is an order of knights but it seems that the houses are actually the ones that have power or the politics on planets i guess and it's house it the binds like the ones that are in charge of the planet of the entire planet yeah so you have cyprian divine um, Cyprian is the leader of the House Divine when the book starts. His oldest son is Albard Divine. He is all messed up because he tried to pair with his knight at one point. It didn't work out, so he's, like, mentally not okay. Um, and then he has a son, uh, a younger son, Raven Divine, which is kind of an, another, like, important character, I would say. He's, he's, oh, he's, he's a character, all right. Yeah. It's very interesting. I can't wait to talk about him because he has a very interesting story and stuff. I, so just just kind of a, to prepare you guys. He's fucking his sister. And it's weird. Yeah, so his sister is <laughs> Lix Divine, who he is sleeping with. And now Lix is actually married to Albard, his older brother. And his mother is Sabella Divine, but that's not Albard's no, mother. It's a stepmother. Yeah, so they're like they're like half brothers, and he like fucks his <laughs> his. They even calls her his sister wife, which fucking just weirds me out. <laughs> yeah, it is strange. So when I first read Sister Wife, I was like, oh, is this like a Mormon thing? Because like they <laughs> call themselves sister wives, right? Like I thought he's had like multiple wives, and then he was like, "Yeah, that's my sister," and I'm like, "Oh, oh it's one of those of sister things. wife." They were talking about uh, yeah, because I was thinking sister wife. I was thinking it was a Mormon thing, and then they were talking about how a lot of the females have 
divination, like they're able to see the future at, at some point. And the reason they were able to do that is because they kept their lines pure. And in my mind, I was like, how pure are we talking here? <laughs> And then he was like, yeah, that's my sister. It's like, oh, that pier. I see, like, literally a stick. <laughs> it's gross. It's weird. Wow. <laughs> okay. And then we have House of Donar, which I'm assuming is another house. I don't know. Um, I, I haven't met them. Yeah, I'm assuming they come in when, during the I, big I night battle. Think, yeah, I think House of Donar is actually the ones that, like, lead the charge. For the protection of the planet. Mm. Okay. I think they had like the strongest night. Okay. Something like that. Now we move on to Imperial Personae. Obviously we have Malkador the Sigilite. Malkador's doing some Malkador stuff. Yeah. We got a really uh, it... <laughs> weird conversation um, between Malkador and the Emperor in this book. And I was I, like, when I got that conversation, I'm like... What is this like alluding to? Like, is this even supposed to be here? Like, it kind of seemed like the conversation was very out of place. Yeah, and it was really weird too because I like I imagine him like just like calling up the emperor. He's like, "Oh, it's gonna go to voicemail." The emperor's like, "Yo, what's up? It's me, <laughs> fighting the, in the warp and shit." <laughs> how's the fighting going? Not good. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, since we, that uh, Leland showed up, he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, Leland's here." He's like, "Cool." You doubted the lion? Yeah. Why? You know he's my bitch, right? He's so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, we knew like some weird shit's happened on his home world. It's the lion. Dude would suck my dick for a quarter. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I just finished watching Upload 2 not long ago. And I still fucking love the scene where he's talking... About the girl from the woman from the Great Depression. He's like, man, some of the Great Depression woman to do anything for a can of soup. <laughs> <laughs> do anything for a can of soup. <laughs> yeah, I just watched that season like three days ago. It was pretty good. Uh, we have Brython Simper, who is basically the like Battlefleet captain above Moloch. Oh, yeah. Yep. Most of these I do not know. Um, and they're... honestly, I don't even remember them. If yeah, I have seen them. There's a big meeting that occurs to discuss Moloch's defenses, um, told by the point of view of Raven Divine. And he mentions all of these people very briefly. He says, this person does this, this person does this, this person does this, and that is it. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can move past Imperial Persona. I don't know any There's... of these people. Someone who is not, I don't know if she's on this list or not, but there is a woman. I, don't, I think you've probably seen her so far. She's the one that like picks up her like husband and kids and then is like on her way to um, this fucking main city, Lupercalia or whatever. Hmm. I've not but, seen that. Okay. Well, 98% sure we have a new perpetual. Oh. Well, that's that's fun. I always love more <laughs> perpetuals, I guess. <laughs> we just lost one. So I guess we can gain another one. Yeah. Okay. The Chosen of Malkador. So these are all the Knight Errants. Obviously, up top, we have Gabriel Loken. We know this. Uh, Acton Kurz. We know this as well. He's working for Malkador. Last we saw him, he was with Dorne executing the last Remembrancer. Mm -hmm. We have Severin. Who, if you don't recall, is from the Outcast Dead. He is the the one dude that just fucked off. <laughs> yeah, like at the end of it, they were like, "Wait, there's still that one running around." So they sent Nagasena to go capture him. That's in some short story that we did not read or listen to, and it turns and I think out him and Nagasena became like BFFs. Yeah, turns out that like <laughs> he's chilling by Nagasena's house on a mountain somewhere, and. uh he works for Malkador now. Yeah, real weird. <laughs> he trains all the knight errants. We have Talos Rubio from the Garo short stories. He's the psyker from the Ultramarines that got picked up from Kalth. Mesa Vereen, who is uh, 
in the Gar Short Toys as well. He got picked up by Garo. Um, he is a word world leader. Yep. Um, that was a very interesting story. Broar Tire Finger. Tire Finger. I was saying. So he is a space wolf, obviously. <laughs> Broar. Broar. Um, Rama. Um, Karayan. He is Raven Guard. Don't know where they picked this guy up from. We have yeah. no idea. He just appears. Um, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, I have no idea. There's only like 17 Raven Guard left, so I don't know. Yeah, is... I don't know how the fuck Corvax was able to like let somebody go. Yeah. Next up, we have Ares Vortex. Um, Tech. Vortex. He is a Iron Hand. He is he's basically like a tech well he's he's an iron hand yeah they're all fucking tech priests yeah <laughs> i'd say he's a tech marine or whatever they're called but like yeah yeah they're all that way so kind of a thing uh alaton home uh white scar poth carry i think right yeah uh kaleon zaven he is emperor's children Tubal Cain is a really fucking hilarious. He is my favorite one. <laughs> he is uh, he is an iron warrior. And it's he just has this like really funny personality because he doesn't hold he just says things without being soft about them. He's very dry. Yeah, like he'll tell somebody like, you're a bad psyker because you could have done this. But not to be mean to them. Yeah, he's like uh, the dude from fucking Guardians of the Galaxy that Batista plays. Oh, yeah. God damn it. I don't remember his name. But yes, I get what you're saying. <laughs> Just no, like sarcasm doesn't get him. <laughs> Drax. Yes. Yeah. So, it. yes, he like just says things and everyone gets super offended. And he's like, what? What are you upset about? I'm confused. <laughs> just, I, I'm just making sense. Is this you know you're, true? You know I'm right. <laughs> He just appears. We have no idea where he's from. We have no idea where the Emperor's Children uh, person is from. Um, Raven Guard. We have no idea where the White Scar or the Space Wolf. We have no idea any of those. Um, yeah, they're there. And then we have Benu Urushua, who is a, the pilot that yep. flies them around places. And the special little ship that's supposed to not be able to be seen, but it's not very strong. Last but not least, we have the Red Angel. Obviously, we know the Red Angel from Fear to Tread. Mm -hmm. um, he was previously an apothecary. Apothecary of the Blood Angels called Marine or something like that. Mm. Uh, really badass character. Really enjoyed his character. Did some weird sacrificial shit at the end of it and became yep. like half demon possessed embodiment of anger Blood Angel. Yeah, that's really weird. Yeah, so now he's being he's imprisoned by Horus, but also like being used by Horus. Like he wants to be used by Horus, but like he'll kill people if he doesn't imprison himself. Yeah, it's really weird. I don't. Did we miss that happening? Was that a short story we missed? At the end of uh, Fear to Tread, he shows up and gets imprisoned, and that's why Erebus is like, "This should have been Sanguinius," and then Horus cut his face off. Uh, yeah. Well, I just cut his fucking head off. Should have. Kind of should have, would have. All right. Premise of the story is basically Horus, uh, at one point in time throughout the crusade, along with Fulgrim, and I believe the lion, if I'm recalling correctly, took a planet called Moloch. And since then, all of this occurred, and he was going through Imperial Records and realized that he didn't actually have a memory of what occurred on Moloch, only that they came and they conquered, and that's it. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, together with Fulgrim and Mortarion, are trying to figure out why Moloch is so secret that it appears that the Emperor has wiped their memory of it in the conquest. By any chance, do you know why? I do. Okay, I was going to ask you what you thought, it, but if you actually know, I'm not going to ask. It was spoiled to me by a train wreck. Bastard. That motherfucker. 
I have a uh, idea of it. But one thing that is important that I guess you can kind of allude to a little bit is on Moloch, it does discuss that there was like a deity called the Thunder Lord or something that appeared. And that's why the Blood Angels are there. They're watching this tower that the that the Thunder Lord like basically came to and then left uh, from that tower place. Um, that's really interesting. Like basically the what it ends up being is very interesting kind of important so this book is really cool it's a big it's a huge drama filled book graham mcneil writes these very well super thick lots going on it's kind of cool to see the original cast back it's it, it, like we're over halfway through the heresy and we kind of get a return to the original group of people that we had three or four books about now so we get to see where they are and what Horace is doing, because for a series called The Horace Heresy, you don't see Horace very much. Yeah. Also, I mean, this is going back, and this might be a spoiler, might not be a spoiler. I don't know. When we interviewed Graham, he mentioned that Sigismund, or not Sigismund, fucking Sanguinius loses on eventual spirit. I haven't seen any indication that he's coming here. Did Graham forget his own book? I don't know. <laughs> Moloch is positioned in the 500 worlds. Is it? Maybe. Uh, it's really hard to tell because the night errands can just kind of go wherever the fuck they want, apparently. Yeah, well, I know it's guarded by the Ultramarines. I, I think it is like either in the 500 worlds or under the jurisdiction of the Ultramarines. So maybe because we know that at this point, the con. This is another thing that is confusing to me. So we have the world eater for Varen, right? Mm. And during that story, the custodian, when he was recruited, the custodian made it apparent that the White Scars had sided with the Emperor. So that must have been after Scars. So that means this book is after Scars. And we know that Scars is after the Unremembered Empire. Yes. So it's possible that Gilliman and Sanguinius and the Lion are all together. And we know that the Lion has that it's probably after because the Lion made his way to McCrag using the teleport device machine while Neiman Russ went all the way back to Terra using regular warp travel. I feel like there was something like super important on my leg. If Gilliman's as smart as he's supposed to be, he'd be like, we should probably guard that more. Horace definitely wants to go there. I think it's very obvious later on in the book that the Emperor didn't want any of his sons to know what was on Moloch. Emperor being the Emperor. Yeah, doing some weird Emperor stuff. Yeah. Obviously, do not skip this book. This is insanely important to the heresy. If you had to read like 10 books, this would be one of the 10. I yeah. would say. Lots and, I'm, of, and I'm only halfway fucking through. Yeah. Lots of Primarchs. Lots of interactions. Um, Gabriel Loken is there. So obviously that's important. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay. Gabriel makes it important. A couple other people show up that I was not expecting from the first book. Which ones? I don't want to spoil anything. I, I, I understand one of them, I think. The there, one. there are two. One of them's a guy. We'll talk after. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have a discussion. So, yeah. So far, I'm really enjoying it. I think it's, I think it's like, uh, very well written. Space battles are okay. <laughs> Man, it's a very the part that kind of sucks, and this I kind of have the same problem with like Angel Exterminatus is like I'm halfway through and they're invading the planet right now, and it's just been nothing but a fucking battle for like ninety pages, and I'm like, is this ending? Like, what comes after this battle? Another battle, probably. <laughs> is it gonna be bigger than like a Where billion is the Titans? Climax at? <laughs> 
Why is Fulgrim shoving things into his body? <laughs> I don't even I don't even know where Fulgrim is anymore. Yeah, Fulgrim definitely he appears like in the beginning, and I haven't seen him ever since. Yeah, I don't know. Where, I don't remember if it's even said like where he went because it's like <laughs> me and Mortarion are just cruising for a bruising baby. Mortarion has some interesting like scenes in here but you don't get any of that fulgrim i'm imagining you're sitting there like i can't wait to shove this entire planet into my body <laughs> man i'm gonna put that so deep in my ass so it's gonna be crazy <laughs> i'm making more. anal beads out of planets and more of a demigato <laughs> slanesh there was something oh yeah the slanesh stuff that happens on moloch so moloch uh people on moloch also like worship slanesh without knowing they call it the serpent god did i miss this conversation yeah like i mean uh, i know there's a serpent thing yeah which is they're like basically like having crazy sex orgies and doing weird torture stuff like it's definitely slanesh i mean the main house fucking incest so i can see I mean, it yeah so it's just <laughs> like oh yeah your sister not even slanesh would approve that <laughs> so I was like, that's a little weird. That's over the line, buddy. <laughs> that's my goal. I'm gonna do something so disgusting that Slanesh feels embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> that's been my goal from day one. Sorry, I haven't done it. That's too much. That's too. I much. started doing it. Mm, this is weird. Mm. I thought the thing was bad. This is weirder. <laughs> the thing. Someone joined the Discord recently, and they're like. Do you hear about Dylan's the thing thing? <laughs> and I was like, God damn it. Like, oh, what episode was that? And I'm like, I feel like it was a long time ago. Holy shit. <laughs> a lot of episodes. We brought up the thing quite a few, but that was like that was a year ago, probably. Yeah, I don't even know like when I like gave that full context. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> was I, like, how drunk was I when I started <laughs> talking about the thing? <laughs> <laughs> that was a story. <laughs> That's okay, though. It's all good. You can have your weird thing, uh, fetishes. Not over it. I clearly don't have any fetishes, so. I'm okay. Not one. Maybe cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Slanesh. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not your sister. It's totally fine. <laughs> good deal. Yeah. Definitely worth a read. Uh, as always, I do enjoy Graham McNeil's books. They're definitely longer. But they're they're yes. fun. They're a good ride. Um, yes. And you never know what the fuck you're going to get. Is it going to be a, a masterpiece? Is it going to be dog shit? I don't know. <laughs> Definitely better than anything either of us could do. How dare you? I <laughs> once wrote a story in like eighth grade. And it was beautiful. Dylan's version of the vengeful spirit. <laughs> and then Fulgrim sat down and shoved 35 magnets in his asshole. Why magnets? You will see. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> it's part of the ritual. <laughs> this is the second During a Why? random battle, he bends over and he goes flying and connects to fucking Horus. And he becomes Horus's sheet or his Horus's fucking spear. <laughs> 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 oh man okay <laughs> Dylan why why is two parts of the book dedicated to Fulgrim's uh, preparation ritual for the battle look it's gonna be it's gonna be crazy it's gonna be the best thing you've ever seen he's gonna be so powerful and Horus is going to embrace the gods <laughs> oh, I can just imagine like the Final battle on Terra. Quick, Fulgrim, I need my spear. <laughs> That's Horus, it. Horus drops the bolter. Fulgrim, <laughs> bend over. <laughs> he goes flying that? at him. He has his claw hand and then his Fulgrim hand. I just, I could just imagine. Like the next, the next, like. Ooh. Actually, maybe uh, he would want to use the claw hand for Fulgrim because Fulgrim <laughs> would definitely like that better. <laughs> further. Uh, I just imagine all the people super upset with the. Uh, you you release like a new edition. You know how they all the fluff at the beginning of all the new edition things. Just crazy story of the Horus heresy, and then the end on the vengeful spirit. Horus used Fulgrim's asshole. <laughs> 
asshole Magnus. <laughs> Happy Emperor. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh my God. What? Damn, that's hot. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize I was reading one of these novels. We, we let Graham write the last paragraph. <laughs> it's a little bit of a twist and turn. It was ADB until the last like 15 pages. <laughs> All right, Graham, you kill the Emperor. How are you going to do it? You're going to use a giant solar engine, some crazy hand to hand combat? The Fulgrim butt plug spear. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hot and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Everyone's like, well, we did tell him he could write one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so that derailed a little bit. <laughs> uh, yep, and that is our preview of The Vengeful Spirit by Graham McNeil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, don't, I haven't read enough to give my, my proper rating, but I yeah, think we'll we both agree week. importance of the Harris. It's probably going to be a 10. Yeah, absolutely. Must read. Yes. So, guys, as always... Shoot the shit with us. Who knows what type of conversation is going to pop up. You do that by going to our Twitter. It is pinned to the top at Heresy Launch. If you feel like contributing to the podcast, we have tips enabled. Everything that goes in there goes right back into it. Uh, email us at theheresylaunch at gmail.com. If you're on YouTube, please like, subscribe, comment. If you're listening to us, please go into the YouTube and hit subscribe. It helps us out. The more the merrier. Those are all the things. We'll be back next week with our review, and you guys have a great one. Happy Easter. That is this weekend. (laughs) Have a good one, guys.